Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good afternoon, everyone, and good evening, because I know there are some people that are across the pond. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's also a pleasure to see so many familiar faces. Um, I have sponsees here, and I also have people that are not my sponsees, but I have the privilege of uh, being of service to them and taking them through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous line by line, which is something I have been doing for 20 plus years. My sobriety date is August 5th, 2000. I do have a sponsor. Um, I have sponsees, I have a home group, and um, I just added a virtual home group. Addition by subtraction is now my virtual home group. Um, So I'm glad to be of service uh, on so many different levels. Uh, I'm here to talk about step two. And before I begin, um, I like to share new experiences as more doors are open on this path. And very recently, um, what I realized is that The bigger my God, the bigger my we. And when I settle into that, it also helps me to settle into when I share, because I realize that at this very time, in this very moment, there's thousands of people doing the same exact thing that I'm doing. So I cannot take myself very serious. I'm one of many. I'm one of many that's carrying a message of what has happened in and through us, in spite of us, because I had to have a deep first step experience. I shared about step one last week. My sobriety date is August 5th, 2000. After, and I'm a big book girl, after four chapters of going through step one, I knew something powerful happened to me on August 5th, 2000. But as I was going through step one, I realized that it was also a miracle. I realized that I didn't have the power to remove the obsession to drink. I didn't have the power to even say on August 5th that was going to be the day. Because the same feeling of despair and misery that I felt on the 5th, I felt on the 4th, I felt on the 3rd, because I was drinking four or five days solid. But why the 5th? I know that in all things, when I stop trying, there's enough space for grace So I get to this place and I realize that on my own, I can't get past where I'm at. I realize that there are still areas of my life where I still show up agnostically because there's some things that all of a sudden I still think that I can start to do on my own and some things I can stop doing. Like right now, I really want to eat healthier And I realized that I just have to bring a lot of willingness to that because on my own, I don't have the power to stay stopped. I can stop eating junk food for for a while, but then I start up again. And so I just bring that desire to God. I had no idea what was wrong with me mentally, physically, and spiritually. That's why I'm very grateful for Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm very grateful for the teachers that God put in my path. I've had amazing amazing teachers that I will always honor. I will never take credit for something that they imparted on me. The thing that really rocked me was I had no idea about this hidden life. They say that we discover the spiritual life. And I get to see that each and every one of us is living life on self-will, our personalities, our perceptions. On my own, I look at your behavior, I look at your personality, and all I do is judge me. That's all I do is judge me. I've been living life outside in because I didn't realize that inside out was the way. I just followed the dictates of the people around me, my mom and my dad, because of their own 
challenges in life. They gave what they could give. They. It's interesting because my dad drank and my dad gambled and my mom was a very angry wife and a mom. And I don't even think my mom realized at the time that she was taking her anger out on us who needed her love. But it's hard to give love when you're angry. And so I didn't have role models in terms of where to find love. And I think that's one the thing that we all are looking for is love. And it's amazing because I don't really remember experience and love, but that's the thing I desired all my life. I'm very grateful that I'm at a place today in my life that I realize that God loves in and through me. So every day it's like, God, I'm willing to die to self so you can love others through me. So I get to step two, and it's interesting because step two out of the 12 and 12, we come to came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. So the same way I had to come to believe in my powerlessness, I had to come to believe that there was a solution, and the solution was not me. It says the moment that we read step two, most AA newcomers are confronted with a dilemma. And what's the dilemma? It's a difficult choice to give up control and this personality that I have been relying upon, because what happens if I'm not me? We can see evidence that there's a better life. But the self that I've relied on all my life does not easily want to die. That's why it's so important that we stay in this fellowship. We stay on this path. I believe that our responsibility is to make the spiritual life inviting for those that have been seekers like me. You come into Alcoholics Anonymous and perhaps one of the thousands of people that are doing what I'm doing right here, right now, in this very moment, you see a solution. You get to say, wow, what they just said is what I've been longing for. God saved me from me so I can be of service to you through God. I come to step two and I have no real conception of God. And that's even after 13 years of Catholic school, and kin including kindergarten. It was never told to me that it was a reliance that I should be seeking. When you go to Catholic school, you can time mass to the minute. Kneel, sit, kneel, sit, kneel, sit, kneel, sit, stand, kneel, sit, stand. And so it was always this ritual. I grew up very afraid of God because I equated God as, as the priest. And it's interesting because today my concept about human beings and God has changed because I believe that we all become vessels of God. We are God in human form. That might be a little too much for some people to hear me say that. But I remember in my second year in Catholic, in Catholic school, I had to make a, my first confession. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, they made me feel like it was I'm a bad child, even in second grade. And I'm trying to come up with these sins. And I go into this booth, and the, 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 the priest opens up this thing, and I hear this thing open, and I can't see him, and it's spooky. And I'm, I don't know how old I am in the second grade, and I'm coming up with a, with a sin, and I realize the sin that I came up with was that I did not eat fish on Friday. See, we had pizza, and I thought that you had to have fish. I didn't realize that it was not, you're not supposed to have meat. And so I grew up with a very punishing God. My mom made me go to church at the earliest mass because she didn't want me to sleep in, especially as I became a teenager. There was a 12-15 mass, but she made me go to the 9 o'clock just so that I would get out of the bed. And I hated her for that. And so what I did to get back at her, I would go to church, but I wouldn't go in church. I would go in the coffee shop, and I'd sit at the coffee shop. And for those New Yorkers, you understand, and you get a, a vanilla egg creams. <laughs> that was my introduction. And I went to Catholic high school, and we were so arrogant at that point. We were smoking pot. And we're debating about Christ. But the crazy thing is, is that right before, and when I say right before, I, I lose track of time when I think about the spiritual life and this path. 
But all I know is I was hanging out with some people and it was getting close. It was getting close to the end. And I remember saying the only thing I have not tried was God and I didn't know how to get to God. So I did absolutely nothing. And I think like with most of us, we have to get to the end of our rope when there's nothing left to try because see, my ego was convincing me that one more time, Donna, one more time, one more, just try harder. But when I was walking down the block on August 5th, 2000, my head was bowed. There was nothing left to try. And like I said, a power burst upon me. Now, the crazy thing is, if I had not gone through the big book, that moment in time, my mind would have had me just push it aside. But because I went through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, what happened to me on August 5th, 2000, I realized I did not stop drinking. When Bill Wilson uses words like the problem was relieved, it was removed, all of a sudden I connected with that. See, the the words in the book were not just words on the book. I, my spirit was meeting those words on the book. And so it's interesting because they talk about this power, this power that is so powerful, but the way the power works is so effortlessly. Things are removed. Things disappear. Things slip away. We rise above. The things that I've been holding on so tightly that was done to me and not done for me, I'm holding on to it so tightly. And if I'm willing to go to any length, there's a shift and those things drop away. And I see all my life, all I've been doing is multiplying suffering because I don't realize what's inside of me is my truth. That the things that were done to me were merely done to me because nothing can take away my birthright. So how do I get to this place that I can say that and look into the light? So when I look at the light on my laptop, I feel like I'm looking right at you. See, I could never look right at you. Number one, I hadn't, I would, I didn't have any conviction in anything to look right at you. See, I've got conviction in what I say. I can look right at you. And so I get to step two and they're saying, yo, Donna, listen, this is your opportunity to discover your truth because I never knew my truth. You would ask me what's wrong with me and the best that I can do <laughs> Is say, you just don't understand. Or I would isolate. I did inventory and I realized one of the reasons why I didn't have children was because I would make my mom a grandmother and my mom and my sister an aunt and I would have to be around them. And I didn't want to be around them because I didn't know how to explain myself to them. And so I come to Alcoholics Anonymous and I say that I'm an alcoholic and I really don't know what one is, but by the the grace and mercy of those of us that are here that are willing to work with others, that are willing to take the time it takes to take us through this book. And as long as it takes, I think step one, it never gets more complicated than one. I've got to have a deep first step experience before I'm interested in being willing to die to self. See, it's very uncomfortable because they're asking us to let go of everything we know and everything we know is everything that we know, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, but it's what I know. You mean to tell me I've got to give that up and then what? But I see you and I see that something happened to you that I've always wanted. I can't my, put my finger on it, but what I'm reading in the book and the living example of those that were willing to go to any length gives me the willingness. See, honesty cannot come first. I cannot be honest to do something unless I'm willing. And so they're saying, Donna, now that you know what your problem is, you're not a bad person. You have an illness that this mental obsession, there was no way you were going to beat the game and your body processes alcohol differently. And that makes so much sense. And then I really get to see what's wrong with me inwardly. I'm not tapped into my truth within the real self, the one that is one with God. And I realize no wonder I live life outside in. No wonder I took everything to heart that happened to me that I thought was 
against me because I had nothing to lean into. I had nothing to rest into. And so they're giving me, they're saying, Don, it's so simple. It's so simple. So they're telling me what I can do if I'm willing to go to any length. It is so simple. I just love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love the way Bill wrote this because he's letting me know that Donna, this is the first time you're going to do this, but it's so simple. I just want you to lay aside prejudice. And then I want you to express even a willingness to believe. They're not telling me to have faith. I can't have faith in something that I haven't tried yet. Even a willingness. Maybe my willingness is, is, is real small. But grace can work with as much willingness as I bring. And then it says, admit the possible existence. Are you checking out the words they're using? Sometimes this is a word-by-word -word exercise. Lay aside. Even a willingness. Admit the possible existence. Earnestly seek. Just keep willing. See, if I earnestly seek, grace will meet my seeking because very often the ego doesn't want to die and it doesn't want us to continue down this path because the self that I created does not want to die. It doesn't want me to align myself with my true self. But I find that with enough willingness, open-mindedness, and honesty, especially when I'm writing inventory, pockets of time will open up that I find myself sitting down with a pen in my hand. I remember I was working in, in the financial district because I'm a New York girl, even though I live in Florida, and I was coming out of the building and I would always carry a few sheets of inventory with me because I never knew when that willingness would, would, would come. And I came out the office building and I had never seen this bench <laughs> that had been there every day I go to work. And, the, and I just saw the bench and I just sat and I wrote. And I wrote until it was uncomfortable because there's something about spiritual writing. You feel what you write. It's different than writing a, a paper for work or a paper for school. You feel what you write. The same thing about reading spiritual literature. We feel what we read. This is for me. I think that everything that I went through was to get to a place of such despair that I finally said, I surrender. I can so that God can say, okay, Donna. Because <laughs> he just wants us to be of service. That's all. We are uniquely qualified to help a segment of the population nobody else can help but us. So Gwen, who's my sponsor, and I shared this this morning when I shared at a meeting, she said to us, she said, she's 90 years old. And she said, you know what? I hope I come back in the next life with problems and despair and misery so I can once again help others. That was the first time I heard somebody say that. And it made me pause. And that was a consideration that I sat with myself. And all that I know and all that I'm realizing, that I'm willing to say the same. So I'm earnestly seeking this power and then the last thing I bring is don't let any prejudice I may have against spiritual terms deter me from honestly asking myself what they mean. See, a lot of us have this prejudice against the word God. It's the word. But if I can get past the word, I can see what the power did for me on August 5th, 2000. And I realize that 
I can come to believe in this power and then I can come to call it God without any problem. Because I realize that one plus one is one. I've been sharing that lately because I'm feeling that today. And so I'm in step two and I'm realizing, okay, it, they're making this so easy for me. See, my willingness might be different from your willingness. But it's all willingness. I'm not trying to compete with you anymore. Rashid would always say, it's not about catching up. It's about catching on. I don't need to catch up to you. You see, all my life I wanted to, and it's even when we say, do we want what they have? I don't want what you have. I want to experience what you experienced. Because what you have, I have. But I didn't know I had it. That's why the world and people had such power over me. I I latched on to you for you to make me feel okay. And then I was resentful because that belief system weren't working. And so now I'm resentful and fearful, resentful, fearful, because what's working? Nothing is working. And then I come to Alcoholics Anonymous. And they're saying, join us on this path. We've let you see to examine the evidence. And they actually say that in the book. We examine the evidence and what what is what is my conclusion that I, I can't get past where I am. So step two for me is the beginning of possibility thinking. Perhaps maybe I can go back to the things that I've always wanted to do in life and how I wanted to feel about myself in life. Maybe just maybe I can revisit that. Maybe I've been lying to myself thinking that the best I can do is the best I can do and just be okay. So many of us fall for that okie doke that we're just okay. See, I can stay in okay because that's the best I can do. I can't get better than just being okay. That's just like how I was when I was drinking and drugging. I was living in the in the world of at least. Well, at least... I can be in recovery and be in at least. Because relying on this, I'm not tapped into the power within. So this makes me think that there's no more to life. So they give us these bedevilments. We're able to look at life. Donna, this is how you've been living inwardly. I just did a, a exercise with some people, and I'm just so grateful for all the teachers I've, I've had in this program. I was introduced to mapping, and I think that was a—I think that's where Ang had 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 gotten it from. And if you put the bedevilments on a piece of paper, and that represents the center, your center, without relying upon the power, prey to misery and depression, you put a circle around that. And then you ask yourself, what do you look like when you're a prey to misery and depression? You write an arrow away. What do I look like? I'm walking with my head bent down. I'm walking with my shoulders hunched over. I'm walking slow. What are my habits? I have a hard time getting out of bed. What are my habits? I can't. I'm lazy. I, I'm watching TV nonstop. I, I mean, I still watch TV, but not like if I was in prey to misery and depression. What's my attitude like? I'm testy. I'm angry. What do I believe about myself when I'm a prey to misery and depression? I feel like I can't, there's, there's no hope. And then I do that for all those bedevilments. And it's no wonder I feel the way I feel. I can't do the things I do. I treat you the way I treat you. And the paragraph after the bedevilments, it says that it's a simple reliance upon God that those things inside of us shift. Well, if I just read that, I can say, okay, that's what they're telling me. But if I really want some buy-in so that I'm willing to go to any length, perhaps if I do this mapping, it says that my ideas don't work. 
And what is my idea that self-sufficiency is enough? Well, I do that map and I'm like, damn, this is the best that I'm doing. And then it's the next sentence. And these sentences, sometimes the big book has these long sentences. And then sometimes these sentences are real small, but the God idea did, period. I love Bill. Sometimes I can share 10 minutes on one sentence in the big book. But the God idea did. Well, how do I know the God idea does? I can just, okay. But see, that's not enough to die to self. It's just like sitting in Alcoholics Anonymous on step one. My life, I'm powerless over alcohol. My life is unmanageable. Trust me, my ego is not threatened by that. It'll convince me that I can sit in this fellowship and not do anything. Okay, I'm powerless. So the God idea does work. How do I know the God idea does work? So perhaps if I'm willing to believe that if I'm relying upon God and the God within and that self, the real self within, maybe instead of pray to misery, maybe instead of pray to misery, maybe inside of me, I'm full of joy. So now what does my life look like? What do I look like when my life is full of joy? By relying upon God. Maybe I'm walking with my head up. Maybe I'm actually smiling at people. Maybe I'm exercising. Maybe I'm cooking. What are my habits? What is my attitude like? Maybe I'm laughing. What do I believe about myself? Maybe I believe that I'm capable, I'm confident. And you do all those for all those bedevilments that have now shifted because you're trusting and relying upon God. Now, when you ask yourself that question, does the God idea work to your satisfaction? Because this is your journey. See, it's my responsibility as a recovered alcoholic to do what I can so you're willing to go to any length. See, I used to give people these exercises and have them do it on their own, but I realized that sometimes that mental laziness will creep in and we won't do it because our egos will tell us, oh, it's not, it's not that important. Oh, I don't have time. Oh, I didn't do it the last time I went through the work. Why do I have to do it now? And so it's been placed in my heart to do these exercises with people so they actually do it because it's, I feel like it's my responsibility to maybe not... So there's not that many obstacles because I know the freedom. I know that now when Rashid used to say it never gets more complicated than one in the, and, and for a very long time, what I saw was it never gets more complicated than step one, which is so true because anytime anything troubles me, I can't figure it out. It's too, it seems too hard. I can relax in it. Do I relax all the time? No. Because sometimes I need to have a deep first step experience, go through some trials and tribulations, go through some pain to be convinced, okay, God. God has gotten so much bigger for me. A lot of you guys know I lost my cat. And and what came up for me very recently in the last couple of days is that... uh, when I was writing out of meditation that Sammy is at peace. But it was because I was going through such sorrow because of Sammy, I kept leaning in the God, leaning in the God, leaning in the God. That the experience that I'm having is so overwhelmingly, my God has gotten so much bigger and so has my we. I feel more connected to the human race than I ever did. So now that I look at that, it never gets more complicated than one. It's gotten so much deeper than it just more complicated than step one. I realize that one is one plus one is one. Me and you is one. Me and God is one. Me, you and God is one. I'm like, wow. And then I, I said out loud, Rashid, I caught on. That I can start this meeting and realize I don't need to be afraid about what I'm going to share Because there's thousands of people doing the same thing at the same time as me, and they're doing it in their way because they're trusting and relying on God to share through them. I'm not the great big such a much that I thought I was. So is God everything to me or is God nothing to me? So I did an exercise, and I have to thank Tyler 
I didn't think I'd go through the work with Tyler when I, I sat in her workshop and every every person I, that took me through the work, I just gained so much. And she said, well, why don't you, and I don't know what her exact words were, but what I did for three days, I didn't pray. I didn't say a set aside prayer. I didn't say anything. And I just lived my life. And, and the proposition was, what if there is no God and all I have is me? And I was willing to do that. What if there is no God and all I have is me? And so I was riding my bike on a path that I always ride my bike. And a family of deer came across the path. I was able to look, and it was a very, it was uh, uh, in, up like Lehigh Valley in, in, in Pennsylvania, for those of you that are up there, that's great, great bike paths up around there. And I was able to see how dead foliage and live foliage are all connected. I saw the fallen trees and how the, the trees that were alive, I, I, I could see that the dead foliage was nurturing. It was food for the live trees. And I had never looked at nature the way I did. And I was able to walk away from that exercise and say, I can say that there is no God all I want, but God still is. I feel like I was given the gift of willingness. I, I've i never not did what was asked of me. I may not have jumped to it very easily, but when you're seeking, when you're willing to seek a relationship with your creator, you get very uncomfortable when you're not doing the work. That uncomfortability, man, is a motivator. I um, used to use this example, and I still use it because I remember the first time that I it hit me what we were going to do here, what's being asked. What's being asked is to let go of all control. Whoa, that's the dilemma. Am I willing to give up control? I was willing, and I remember it was my first honest prayer. And it really didn't hit me until I was writing my fear inventory because I was willing to believe in this power greater than myself. And so for a deeper second step experience, what Adrian, another teacher, had given me to do, he gave me an extended second step experience, a second step that I give to people that I work with. Am I willing to believe that there's a power greater than myself that can take me beyond where I am now in every area of my life, past here, past the experiences I've already had? And do I believe that there's realms of peace, joy, and happiness that I can't even imagine? See, if I look at that all in one sentence, it seems impossible. And I realize that anything that grand it's hard for me to be willing to believe that that can happen to me because I am so limited in my scope of what I think freedom can look like I can look at that and say oh no there's no way that I can have all of that but I was willing to believe because I saw what I did. I saw that on my own, I tried to commit suicide and my mind never once said, Donna, what are you doing? My mind never protected me from that act. My mind could never let me see that day in, day out, convincing that I had to trudge through life every time I woke up and had no money about to lose another job, so I would quit a job. I'm isolating from friends and family. My mind could not help me in that. And then I get to this place and I realize that what happened to me was not of me. So if God can do that, 
I'm willing to believe that there are realms of peace, joy, and happiness I can't even imagine. And I'm willing to write what that looks like. And I'm willing to write it because I see the people that God placed in my life. They have something I've always wanted. Now, I was willing to write it. I was willing to do step three, but it wasn't until I got to step four that it really hit me. I don't know why. I don't know why. That's the thing. We have to stop looking for the experience. I have to stop. Well, this is supposed to happen in two and three and four. No, no. Because what happened to me in four, based on what I think I know, that should have happened in step two. But I realized that, oh, my God. I now know what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to give up all power and control. And I felt like I was up on a cliff, up high. And it was my first honest prayer at 40-something years old, out of 13 years of Catholic school and religious religious instruction. And, and it was by way of a simple conversation. I remember I was standing in my mother's dining room, looking out the window. There's certain experiences and places and time that I don't forget. And I stood there and I and I said, God, I'm willing. And I thought about Loretta and Sydney because they were the first teachers God sent me to. And I remember when we got to the paragraph in We Agnostics and where they tell us where God can be found. I remember Sydney was telling this to Loretta the other day. I remember Sydney looked at me. It was like he was so happy that I finally was discovering where to find God. I never forget the look he gave me. Like, see, Donna, that's weird. And he smiled as he looked at me. And so I felt that I was willing to go to any length because I, I so believed. And then by this time, I had been going to, to meetings and hearing people like Mark Houston and Peter when he lived in Brooklyn. And, I, and I'm like, who are these people? Like, I felt like I was around people in AA that was doing something more powerful than the regular people I saw in AA. And now I realize that we're all alcoholics. Some of us are willing to go to any length and some of us are still waiting to be moved by the spirit. And who knows, we never know, we're in a meeting sharing and maybe something that I share moves somebody to move the needle. I don't know who you are, God knows who you are. And so I'm standing in my mother's dining room table and I said, God, I am willing to go to any length and I know what, what I have to do. I said, but I feel like I'm up on this cliff up high. And I'm willing to jump but are you going to be there to catch me? That's, I just wanted to know if God was going to catch me. Never forget that. So we're in step two and they're not saying anything about faith yet. They're saying, just be willing to believe. And so I use this, I think Loretta had shared this with me and I share this with others. I may not be willing to attempt this relationship with God with faith at first because I've never tried. So it's understandable. And it's just like if I have a, a computer that needs fixing and Annie says, Donna, take this business card. This guy can fix your computer. So I take the card and I take the computer to the guy that Annie's recommending. I'm not going to the guy with faith because he's never... I've never dealt with him, but I go with the willingness to believe he's going to fix the computer. Right? I don't know for sure. And so he fixes the computer. And then I have another piece of equipment that also needs fixing. Well, the next time I go back, I go back in faith because I've experienced it. So faith is a result of results. That's why I've got to lay aside prejudice because if the God that I'm coming in here with is the same God that I've been running from. That's why when we get to page 10 in Bill's story, 
We don't know what Ebby was saying, but they talked for hours. And this is why we are uniquely qualified, because I wasn't talking to anybody that long. And we know that Bill started thinking about religion and thinking about his childhood. So maybe that's what we should do. What is my concept coming in with? What is this concept that my mind wants me to hold on to? What is this belief? Because I realize that when I get to step four, I'm looking at a whole bunch of beliefs that are not serving me. And so maybe the belief that I have about God, maybe I could, I could again, this is about giving yourself permission. Give yourself permission to ask the hard questions. What is my current belief about God that I'm holding on to? Because I have a mind that wants to hold on to a disbelief so hard. But if I've never experienced God, why am I disbelieving God? Maybe I've been blaming God. See, I could have blamed God for Sammy. But I'm realizing for me, it's the hardships that bring me closer to God. You know how I feel about my little cat? (laughs) I felt like Sammy was the martyr for me. Maybe that was the role he was assigned to get my attention so I can lean in. And as I was leaning in when when, when I didn't know where Sammy was, see, all of a sudden I started having these intuitive thoughts. You know what I thought about? And I never thought about this. I'm sitting here leaning in the God. Every time I thought about where Sammy is, I'm leaning in the God. You know what the thought came to me was my mom leaning in when she didn't know where I was. And I wept in that. I never once thought about what my mom was going through when I was going on a four or five day run. Was she leaning into God when she didn't know? Only thing I worried about was what she was going to say when I showed up. Powerful, right? I also had an experience of gratitude. I'm starting to experience these principles on a level that I have never in the beginning and I just had a willingness to believe I know I'm going way past step two but perhaps maybe I'm going way past step two so that if you are at step two you'll be willing I had such an experience and I thought I saw Loretta Sidney and and Rashid the three teachers that God placed in my life and I realized how grateful I am for them And I wept out of gratitude. And then I was able to see what they must have meant for my mom. That my mom, my mom now saw the same light that I saw as she now knew who was surrounding her daughter. That's the kind of, that one plus one is one. God's thoughts become my thoughts. So every day I'm willing to die to self so I can live life. God can live life in and through me and I can be here and share and not care if <laughs> what I said. I just know that um, thank you for allowing me to share. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Rasa. Hi, I'm Kira and I'm an alcoholic. And before we get started today, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Donna, for that beautiful, powerful, uplifting, enlightening share. I um, I greatly appreciate it. As Rasa mentioned, this is a Q&A and a time to get all of your questions answered by Donna. We are going to come in with Bobby first. Bobby, would you like to unmute and come in and ask Donna a question? Absolutely. I'm a great talk. My name is Bobby. Very grateful to have made it to this meeting. Thank you for sharing, Donna. Carly, thank you for getting me on this meeting. Wouldn't have happened. That just happened. But I'm going to ask a question that Donna answered for me yesterday in depth, and the day before. And I asked it because it would help me help others. And I heard her say, die to self so many times. And I've been in the spiritual path 
for 58 years. I've been in recovery since 94. I had a great, I, I felt it, but I, she explained it so well. So Donna, tell us, what does Die to Self mean? Hi, Bobby. So good to see you, brother. So dying to self for me means dying to this personality that I created, you know, and it says we have to clean house. And for me, it's, it's clean house of the self that keeps me separated from you and keeps me separated from God. Because I realize that on my own, I don't know how to love. I think it's God loving through me. I think we become vessels. When it says that we have to fit ourselves, for me, I believe that we just have to be in position for God to minister through us, to love through us, to have compassion. I get to die to self because I get to see that I am no more or no less than another human being, and I get to see that when I write inventory. I get to see that we're all spiritually unconscious at times. Our symptoms change. But the self that I created just looks at your symptom and judge your symptom because your symptom goes against what I believe is right or wrong. So God, have all of me, what I perceive is right, what I perceive is wrong. Let me die to that self I created so my true self that's one with you and one with others can live. That's it for me. Thank you so much, Donna, for that answer. And thank you, Bobby, for that question. Okay, Carly, would you like to come in? Thank you. Thank you, guys. Carly, addict, um, alcoholic from the UK. Not that I'm any different to you. Um, Donna, thank you. I adore you. Thank you, Donna's God, for guiding you to me. And I will allow you to have my cat virtually because she has an honest desire to stop eating treats. So she's welcome here too. Um, I just wanted to ask you what you think about this because um, when I hear about faith and people coming into recovery and not believing or we agnostics, um, it's really strange because a couple of times it's come up today about superstition. So there's a couple of people in a meeting yesterday that said they didn't believe in God and were an agnostic, but they wanted to salute a magpie and they wanted to not walk under a ladder and they wouldn't cross three drains. And I heard someone else say it today and actually it made me think back on page seven with Bill's story, he says um, when he was explained about his illness by Dr. William Silkworth, there's a bit where he said, I fared forth in high hope for three or four months, the goose hung high and I looked this up and this meant it's an expression based on superstition of that time. When goose flew low, it meant that evil spirits were present. And when geese flew or hung high in the sky, evil spirits were gone and all was well. So do you believe like do you believe that that is some kind of faith with the superstition? You could use that as a kind of faith. Thank you. Those are things that I don't concern myself with, if that's how a person believes in what at in any moment. Um, if that's the, the, the belief that they want to believe in as a journey, because it's really um, the spirit within. Um, if that's how a person feels and that ha that's how a person feels, they'll have an experience from that. Um, that's, that's, that's none of my business. I, try to stay out of those kinds of things. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how to answer that because I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> thank you, Donna. And thank you, Carly, for that question. Denise, would you like to come in? Yes. Hello. My name's Denise, a, a grateful recovering alcoholic. Um, Donna, thank you so much for that wonderful share. Um, it was amazing to me because I too have grown up in Catholicism and went through 12 years of Catholic school and I have always had my head in the clouds and, and looking around at nature and the connections and so on and so forth. But when you said your first real prayer that you feel like you're up on a cliff 
ready to jump. And I have felt that way too, because when you said you ask God, are you willing to catch me? Sometimes I don't hear that voice. I may feel it as a small, uh, like flutter or happiness in my heart or um, something else. But like some people say, oh my God, God told me to go to big lots and help someone. <laughs> you know? I was like, oh my goodness, what am I missing? How do, you know, what did he say to you when you said that? When you asked him, are you willing to catch me when I jump? Thank it you. was, it, it was, it was just an increased willingness to continue. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. And Thank I just you. want to add with Carly, like, if that's, if a person's belief is that belief that, that they can, they can just continue because we grow, at least I grew. What are, The things that I'm saying today, I was not saying 21 years ago. Mm-hmm. But what I had was enough to get me to where I am today. So um, if it's superstition. Thank you, Donna, for that question. And we are, just so y'all know, um, Donitha is going to be our last question. And then, Annie, we do have a meeting after the meeting where you can absolutely come in to share um, and get questions answered. So I am going to ask Barbara Marie, would you like to come in? Yes, thank you so much, Barbara Marie. I'm visiting the first time at this meeting from Staten Island. Uh, grateful alcoholic. Um, Donna, you you really moved me. Um, and I pulled over. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I had to get to you. That's how compelling you were. And it was both painful and healing to hear your story because I had that angry mother and just stop me when I'm not allowed to share any longer. Just mute me. I did take your number. I, I would love to speak with you. Um, I had that angry mother and exactly what you said. <laughs> These are good tears. You were just looking, you know, that maybe someone, you know, the love and the Catholic school, you know, I was one of those that rolled up my skirt and smoked in the back of the bus. <laughs> I mean, so many, I haven't identified with someone's uh, chair. I'm Barbara, I'm so sorry to it's gently okay. interrupt. If that's um, all you have? Okay. Thank you so much for coming in. And Donitha, you are going to be our last, our last question for Donna. Hi, my name is Donika, and I'm an alcoholic. Um, thank you so much, Donna. The question is, um, so sad. I struggle so much with um, constantly believing in higher power when I've suffered so many burdens, and I don't know how quite to turn this around. Thank you. It's my burdens that bring me closer to God. Um, I got real sick seven years in. I convinced myself that I didn't have time for prayer and meditation so that it became non-existent. So my journey hasn't always been a straight one. And I got real sick. I got in a relationship and he became my God and I got real sick, real emotionally sick. And it just made me seek God even more. So I think we have a choice. What is my choice to be? God is everything or God is nothing. If I'm going through some hardships and I'm going through some crap, am I saying God is nothing because I'm not relying on God or am I hanging on for dear life? God is everything to the point that I'm leaning so far in that I rest in that. Thank you.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.